Hello lovely people, it's Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Welcome back to my Neuroanatomy playlist. In previous videos, we talked about the cranial nerves, such as cranial nerve 1, which is the olfactory nerve, and cranial nerve number 2, which is the optic nerve. As for today, we'll dig deeper into the optic nerve, namely the visual pathway. You will recall that the optic nerve is sensory, special sensory to be specific, special sensory afferent. That's what it is. So let's say that I looked at an object. This image will fall onto my retina and it will be flipped, meaning right will be left and left will be right. It will also be inverted upside down. So up is down and down is up, which is Orwellian if you think about it. No one will understand this joke. After this, I am now in the optic nerve, carrying nerve impulses. You go optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract. After the optic tract, there is the lateral geniculate body, on the left and on the right. Then I have my optic radiation, which will radiate me towards the visual cortex in the occipital lobe of my cerebral cortex. Click the like button, click the subscribe button, and let's get started. Please watch the videos in this anatomy playlist in order, especially the videos on olfactory nerve, and the optic nerve. Remember, here's the brain. You draw the line in the sand by the central sulcus right here. Anything in front, motor. Anything behind is sensory, most of the time. Look at this, look at this. I'm trying to see a tree. I wanna see something. Oh, to see is to sense. That's a sensory function. That's why it's in the back of the brain behind this imaginary line. The primary visual cortex is here. Now, which Broadman areas are in the visual cortex? Please comment below. Is it Broadman area one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it 17 or what? What's the nervous system? We have central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system is made of brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves. All of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves are peripheral nervous system, except only the optic nerve. The optic nerve is central. Look at this, here's my neuron. This is the soma or the cell body, and this is the axon. As we have discussed before, a collection of somas or cell bodies in the central nervous system is called a nucleus, but a collection of somas in the peripheral nervous system is called a ganglion. Next, a collection of axon fibers in the central nervous system is a tract, but in the peripheral nervous system, this is called a nerve. Recall the distribution of the cranial nerves. Cranial nerve 1 and 2 come from the forebrain, 3 and 4 from the midbrain, 5, 6, 7, 8 from the pons, 9, 10, 11, 12 from the medulla. 2, 2, 4, 4. Forebrain, midbrain, pons, medulla. Two nerves from here, two nerves from there, four from here, four from there. Olfactory nerve is attached to the telencephalon, which is a part of the forebrain. But the optic nerve is attached to the diencephalon, which is part of the forebrain as well. Diencephalon includes anything that has the word thalamus in it. Because as we'll see, we'll go retina, optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, and then lateral geniculate body, which is part of the thalamus. And the thalamus is part of the diencephalon. And the diencephalon is part of the prosencephalon. If you have watched my previous videos in this neuroanatomy playlist, everything that I've said should make perfect sense to you. You can download these colorful notes on my website medicosisperfectionatus.com. I help you understand and pass exams. Let's review cranial nerve 1. What did we have? We had the mucosal cells in the roof of your nose. Then what? From between them, we have the bipolar neurons. Oh, so I have epithelium, and then from within the epithelium emerges nerve fibers. These nerve fibers will relay onto the mitral cell of the olfactory bulb. And then after the olfactory bulb, we have the olfactory tract, which will take us to the telencephalon part of the prosencephalon. So you go epithelium, then nerve fibers, then bulb, then tract, then forebrain. Now look at the optic nerve, it's the exact same story. We're talking epithelium here. What kind of epithelium? Oh, remember the retinal epithelium? Yeah, like layers of the retina. Yeah, which part of the layers? Which layer? Ganglion cell layer. The ganglion cell layer will make us the axons of the optic nerve. And then you go nerve instead of bulb, say chiasm. 
And after the bulb, what do we have? We have a tract. And after the tract, what do we have? Part of the forebrain. But here it's the diencephalon instead of the telencephalon. So, retina, optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, diencephalon, namely the lateral geniculate body, then optic radiation, one goes upstairs, the other goes downstairs, until we end up on the visual cortex in the occipital lobe of the cerebrum. Recall that the definition of a collection of cell bodies in the peripheral nervous system is called what? A ganglion, hence ganglion cell layers in the retina. A collection of axons in the peripheral nervous system, i.e. outside the brain, is called what? It's called a nerve, hence optic nerve. And after this, as I get closer to the brain and into the brain, I have what? A collection of uh, axons in the central nervous system what's that called that's the definition of a tract see medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the french toast you're talking about now on to today's topic the visual pathway and the deficits or the defects of the visual pathway again retina optic nerve optic chiasm optic tract one on the left one on the right then after this lateral geniculate body here and here then optic radiation which will radiate me towards the visual cortex. What's the name of the artery that supplies the visual cortex? It is the posterior cerebral artery. Because light has to travel in straight lines, when I look at the tree, up will become down in the retina, and down in order to travel in a straight line will become up in the retina. Up is down, down is up. Now let's suppose that we had a left branch and a right branch coming out of the tree, right will become left and left will become right which means the right visual field will fall onto the left retina and vice versa. By the same token, that superior in my visual field will become the inferior in my retina and vice versa. Let's talk about this. This is my left eyeball. This is my right eyeball. And this is the visual field in front of my left eye. And this is the visual field seen by my right eye. What would you call this orange color? Oh, it is closer to my nose. So this is the nasal visual field. Here's the nasal field on the left side, and here is the nasal field on the right side. Let's follow the nasal visual field. Because light has to travel in a straight line, the nasal becomes temporal in the retina. So this is nasal field, but this is temporal retina. The temporal retina, closer to your temple, will continue as temporal fibers inside the optic nerve. Let's talk about the temporal visual field. Oh, it will fall onto my nasal retina. And the nasal retina will continue on as nasal fibers in the optic nerve. How about the right eye? Here is my nasal visual field. It will fall onto the temporal retina and then temporal retinal fibers in the right optic nerve. How about this? This is my temporal field, thus nasal retina and nasal fibers in the right optic nerve. Then what? Then you go to the optic chiasm. In the optic chiasm, only the nasal fibers will cross to the other side. So the left nasal fibers will go to the right optic tract and the nasal fibers in the right optic nerve will cross to the left optic tract. But how about these orange temporal fibers? They will continue as is without crossing to the other side. So who crossed? When it comes to fibers, only the nasal fibers cross to the other side. When it comes to field, since the nasal fibers are responsible for the temporal field, it is the temporal field that crossed to the other side. Don't forget that the nasal fibers carry temporal visual field while the temporal fibers carry nasal visual field. And then after the optic tract on the left and on the right, you go to the lateral geniculate body, which is part of the thalamus. If you read an old textbook, this was part of the metathalamus, but now the metathalamus is considered a piece of the thalamus. And the word metathalamus, which included LGB and MGB, fell out of favor. In other words, if you consider LGB as part of the thalamus, that is correct. If you consider it part of the metathalamus, that's correct as well. It's just a matter of lingo, how we classify the thalamus, how you slice it and dice it. After the lateral geniculate body, we go to the optic radiation, which will radiate me to the visual cortex. 
Now let's add some deficits. Imagine that I have a problem here at number one, which is the left optic nerve. Suppose that I severed my left optic nerve. What's going to happen? Well, the entire left eye is gone, which means the entire left visual field is gone. What do you call this? This is called left anopia or left anopsia. What does the word anopia mean? An means no, opia means vision. There is no vision on the left side. You can also call it left monocular vision loss. Monocular means monoocular, one eye. Only one eye is toast, the other is healthy. Here is a different scenario. Suppose that I have a tumor such as a pituitary adenoma, let's make it a prolactinoma for example, or a craniopharyngioma growing here, pressing on the center of the optic chiasm. Who's gonna suffer? The blue fibers, i.e. the nasal fibers, which are responsible for what? For the temporal visual field. So the patient will complain of what? I cannot see the temporal area here, and I cannot see the temporal area there. So temporal and temporal, bi-temporal. Half and half, hemi. Cannot see, cannot see. Anopsia or anopia. I want you to pause the video, rewind and replay the last two minutes because the next section will get brutal, so you need to master these two facts first. Remember that light has to travel in straight lines, like this. The superior visual field will become the inferior retina and the inferior retinal fibers. But the inferior visual field will become the superior retina and therefore superior retinal fibers. So here is the visual field, here is the retina, optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, until the lateral geniculate body. Then we go towards the brain itself, the optic radiation, because one optic radiation will go upstairs, the other will go downstairs. And then we'll talk about the visual cortex. Let's go. The upper visual field, I use the green color for the leaves, will become inferior or lower retina, which means lower retinal fibers inside the optic nerve, lower optic nerve fibers, lower optic chiasm, lower optic tract, lower part of the lateral geniculate body. Then what? In the optic radiation, I'll take the lower route. Which one is lower anatomically speaking? Is it the parietal lobe? or the temporal lobe, think about it. Oh, of course the temporal is lower, which means I'll go to the temporal lobe. And since this is near the ventral surface of the brain, we call it ventral optic radiation. So I am in the lower lobe, I mean the temporal lobe, and I am downstairs. And I will form a loop around the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. Who discovered this looping action? someone called Meyer, hence Meyer's loop. Now let's talk about the stem of the tree, which was downstairs in my visual field, but in my retina, it will be upstairs. Upper retina, upper part of optic nerve, upper part of optic chiasm, upper part of optic tract, upper part of lateral geniculate body in the thalamus or the metathalamus, and then upper lobe. What do you mean? Parietal or temporal? Which one is higher anatomically speaking? The parietal lobe until I end up on the visual cortex. Did you form any loop around any structure? No, I did not loop. I went straight ahead, across, through the internal capsule without looping around any structure. So what's the name of this one? Since this is closer to the dorsum of the brain or the dorsal surface, we call it the dorsal optic radiation. But this one is the ventral optic radiation. So let's end up on the visual cortex. The one upstairs will end up upstairs above the calcarine sulcus. And the one downstairs that formed that Myers loop will continue downstairs and will end downstairs below the calcarine sulcus. Supra-calcarine, infra-calcarine. What's the name of this gyrus above the calcarine sulcus? It is called the cuneus gyrus. And what's the name of this gyrus below the calcarine sulcus? It's called the lingual gyrus. How do I remember which is which? Easy. One of the primal urges of humans is to eat. Very primal, very basic. So we'll think of downstairs, basic. And then when I eat, what do I do? I like the food. Mmm, delicious. Yum, yum, yum. Yum, 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 with the M. Okay. 
which reminds me of what? Yummy and delicious. The M reminds me of Meyer's loop in that temporal lobe. And what do you do when something is delicious? You do exactly like this emoji. You loop your tongue around your lips. I am looping this ventral optic radiation around the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. Because as you recall, the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle is inside the temporal lobe. Of course, it makes sense. So, lower primal urges, meaning lower retina and lower fibers. Remember, yummy, which means Meyer, which means temporal lobe. What did Meyer do? Loop his tongue around his lips. Loop the ventral optic radiation around the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. And because this is a primal urge, it will end up below the calcarine sulcus, infracalcarine, in the lingual gyrus, because I did this emoji with my tongue. All of this was true for the lower fibers responsible for the upper visual field. That's the only mnemonic that you need to remember, the yummy mnemonic. And therefore, the other one is the other one. How about the upper retina, upper fibers, upper optic nerve, upper optic tract, upper LGB, etc.? You go to that, not the temporal, but upstairs, parietal. Not around the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle, but through the internal capsule. Not below the calcarine, but above the calcarine sulcus or supracalcarine towards the cuneus gyrus. Later, when we talk about the spinal cord, you will discover the cuneatus and gracilis tract. The cuneatus tract is in the back of the spinal cord, posterior, just like the cuneus gyrus, posterior, because posterior is sensory, behind my imaginary line. Neuro makes sense, finally. Quick note, don't forget that this visual cortex is also known as the striate cortex. Now to belabor this point, because it's worth belaboring, please bring a pen and paper and let's draw this together. I need two colors. Okie dokie, here is the tree. And then what? This green, which is superior visual field, will become inferior retina. Then what? Inferior optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, inferior part of the lateral geniculate body. Then what? I go to the inferior lobe, i.e. temporal lobe, by making a loop around the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle, only to end up below the calcarine sulcus or infracalcarine inside the lingual gyrus. How about the stem of the tree? Downstairs in my visual field will become upstairs in my retina. Superior retina, superior fibers, superior optic nerve, optic chiasm, optic tract, upper part of the LGB, upper lobe, which means temporal lobe, straight through the internal capsule. And then what? And then I end up on the visual cortex above the calcarine sulcus, i.e. supracalcarine in the cuneus gyrus. So here's the retina, optic nerve, optic nerve, optic chiasm, then we have optic tract on the left, optic tract on the right, left lateral geniculate body, right lateral geniculate body, then we have optic radiation. The one downstairs is the Myers loop, goes to the temporal loop, which is responsible for the superior visual field. And the one upstairs goes to the parietal lobe, responsible for the lower visual field. Then we end up on the visual cortex, supplied by the posterior cerebral artery. Now let's talk about visual pathway deficits. We already talked about one and two. One is severing my optic nerve or destroying the entire left eye. This will cause left anopia, which is left complete monocular vision loss. Number two is the pituitary adenoma or craniopharyngioma pressing on the central part of the optic chiasm. Before you know it, I have tunnel vision by temporal hemianopia. I lost the temporal side on the left visual field and the temporal side on the right visual field as well. How about a lesion in the left optic tract or left lateral geniculate body or left optic radiation up and down, i.e. in the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe. What do you think is going to happen? Let's think about this logically. You see here, I cut the temporal fiber on the left side. The temporal fibers are responsible for the nasal visual field. So I will lose the nasal visual field on the left eye. How about the blue? Oh, this blue belongs to the right side. It was the nasal fiber for the right eye, which means temporal visual field. So I will lose the temporal visual field on the right eye. So my left visual field lost the nasal, but my right visual field lost the temporal. Now I want you to look at this. The lesion was on the left side of the brain, but the visual deficit was felt on the right 
half of each eye. Here's the right half of this eye, gone. Here's the right half of that eye, also gone. When the lesion is on the left and the deficit is on the right, it's called contralateral. Left became right. Amazing. Since this is the right side or right half of this eye and the right half of this eye, they are homonymous or synonymous. Homologous. Oh, okay. Got it. And then what? Half of this eye and half of this eye. Hemianopia. This is complete anopia. This is hemianopia. This also is hemianopia. You can call this one heteronymous hemianopia because here's the left half and the right half. But here it is right half and right half, so it is homonymous hemianopia. Heteronymous hemianopia, homonymous hemianopia. What if the lesion is in the Myers loop, i.e. temporal lobe? This is the ventral optic radiation. What's going to happen? Look, the lesion is on the left side, which means the deficit will be on the right side, the right part of this eye and the right part of that eye as well. Since the Meyer loop is downstairs, it is responsible for the visual field upstairs. So I will lose this upper right quadrant and this upper right quadrant. So is this hemianopia? No, no, that's not hemi, that's quarter. So quadrant anopia. The lesion is on the left side of the brain, but the deficit was felt on the right part of the eyes right parts of the visual field. So, contralateral. Which quadrants did you lose on the right side? Did you lose the upper ones or the lower ones? The upper ones. So, superior quadrant anopsia, because all of these are named from the patient's perspective, not from the perspective of what happened in their brain, but from their experience in reality. So, this one could be called contralateral homonymous hemianopia because the lesion was on the left, but the deficit on the right. You can simply also call it right homonymous hemianopia because I lost the right half and the right half. Similarly, you can call this contralateral superior quadrant anopsia because it's contralateral to the lesion, but you can just name it since I know that this is the left side, so the deficit will be felt on the right side. I can simply call this right superior quadrant anopsia. Next, how about damaging the other optic radiation, i.e. the dorsal optic radiation? Oh, it is upstairs, which means responsible for downstairs in my visual field. So I lose downstairs and downstairs. Lesion is on the left, so the deficit is on the right. Right lower. Oh, so it's contralateral inferior quadrant anopsia or right inferior quadrant anopsia. What if I damage my visual cortex on the left side, such as stroke or a thrombus in my left posterior cerebral artery? It will be very similar to damaging both of the optic radiations, such as number five, just like this. However, the most important part of your retina is the macula, here and here. The macula has bilateral cortical representation. Even if one cortex or one half or one hemisphere is screwed, the macula is spared because the macula also gets supply from the other cortex. So number eight is exactly the same as number five with one exception. The macula, which is the fovea, which is the central vision, is spared. So what do you call this? Exactly like you call this. This was called contralateral homonymous hemianopia. So this is contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing because I spared the central macula because the macula has bilateral cortical representation. Even if one side is gone, the other side will also supply the macula. Next, number nine. Where is number nine? Oh, this is age-related macular degeneration, ARMD or AMD. Oh, what's going to happen? It destroys the central vision. It destroys the macula. It's called macular degeneration for heaven's sake. What do you think is going to happen? Well, this happened in my right eye, so my right visual field will suffer. This happened in my right macula, so the right macula is gone. I lost this right central vision, so it's called right central scotoma. What does scotoma mean? It means darkness. As for deficit number 10 and deficit number 11, what are these? Please let me know the answer in the comment section. Now let me blow you away. Here is my left visual field. Here is my right visual field. Let's use colors, please. So this is what my left eye is seeing right now. So here is temporal, here is nasal, visual field. This is superior, this is inferior, visual field. Which means this is superior nasal, this is inferior nasal. Superior temporal visual field, inferior temporal visual field on the left side. 
and you repeat the same thing for the right side. Remember that the visual field is the exact opposite of the retina. Let's follow the orange. Here the orange was inferior nasal, but here it is superior temporal. How about the green? It was superior nasal in my visual field, but now the green is inferior temporal in my retina. Just like George Orwell. Down is up, nasal is temporal, down is up, down is up, temporal is nasal, up is down, temporal is nasal. And on the right side, the retina is the inverse of the visual field. And then what? In the optic nerve, we are similar to the retina, but slightly rotated. Look at the pink color, for example, it became here. Oh, so we are flipped a little, but no one cares. Now look at the lateral geniculate body. Why does it have only two colors instead of four? Because remember that the nasal fibers on this side, on our side, went to the other side. So they no longer exist as far as the left visual field is concerned. See, the inferior part of the visual field became superior in the LGB. And the superior in the visual field became inferior in the lateral geniculate body. No more crossing, please. They will end up in the visual cortex as is. The orange will go supracalcarine and the green will go infracalcarine, which means that the supracalcarine upstairs in my cortex was responsible for the infra or inferior visual field. Conversely, the infracalcarine is responsible for the superior visual field. How about the other colors? Oh, that's the other LGB, as you can see. And same thing here. Supracalcarine is infra in the visual field, and infracalcarine is supra in the visual field. And don't forget that in reality, your left visual field and right visual field are convergent. So they are not two separate circles. In fact, these two circles will kiss and hug and get closer to one another until they intersect. Please take a moment to pause and review. Quiz time. Look at this. Can you name the visual deficit? And can you tell me where is the problem in the brain? And for this one, please name the visual deficit and tell me the site of injury in the brain. You will find the answer key in the next video in this neuroanatomy playlist. The next video is titled Oculomotor Nerve. Do you want to learn about ophthalmology surgery, orthopedic surgery, trauma surgery, and much more? If so, download my surgery high yields course on my website medicosisperfectionaries.com. Do you want to learn about anti-epileptics, anti-psychotics, anti-depressants, anti-Parkinsonian medications? Download my CNS pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionaries.com. There are more than 1,700 free videos on this channel, plus 300 premium videos for those who click the join button and choose the highest tier. Please subscribe, hit the bell, click the join button. You can support my channel on Patreon, PayPal, or Venmo. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases, or if you'd like me to personally tutor you. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.